this evening, inshallah, the 21st of June, 2022, uh, we're going to uh, continue with the fourth reading from what has been translated as the journey to Allah. al Mahajja fi Sayyir al-Dulja by al hafiz ibn Rajib al-Hanbali, rahimahullah ta'ala. So in the first three lessons, uh, if somebody... Uh, asked you, what have you covered in the first three lessons? How would you sum it up? First three readings. Yeah, go ahead. First lesson was the introduction of what the is, what the book is, and then we talked about the first principle, which mm-hmm. is that no one enters Jannah by their actions independently, but it is by the Rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we talked about how to earn the Rahmah of Allah, mm-hmm. and those actions will love us to Allah. Okay. Good. Anybody else? You think stand out? Yeah. Oh, one of the benefits is about this only is about you know, it's actually um, it does help us how to be humble mm-hmm. and how to see that um, we be humble slave of Allah and how to see that whatever deed we are doing we should not be too arrogant mm-hmm. so that we can see more, that, um, we can see the good um, things of Allah. There you are. Okay. So okay. So if we if we were to just say what's this book about, right? So it's an explanation of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, where he mentions that none of you will enter Jannah. Nobody is going to enter Jannah by virtue of his deeds alone, independent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. And we talked about uh, ways to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy because he's mentioned that in the Quran. We talked about the benefit of knowing this principle, one of which was just mentioned by the brother, which is that it, it helps to keep you humble. Is there another benefit in knowing that your deeds alone will not allow you to enter Jannah? Hmm. Go ahead. Okay. It'll make, it, it, it'll make you repent. Tell you. Hey, uh, what? What well, cave shukr? Yeah, I explain that. Uh, being grateful. Being grateful for what? For 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 um, the Allah is His rahmah. Being grateful for the, what you're doing your deeds, and you know that your deeds don't equal up to what Jannah is. But Allah, because you know, like in that ayah, you, you know, not the ayah, not the ayah. I know with the explanation at first, you said something like, um, if you um. You, you explained, you said, if you go, if somebody goes and has no money, mm. something that's $100,000, mm-hmm. he has no money, but somebody comes with 50000 he gives it to him. Mm. That's, that's going to give you shukr, because you know you can't equal what you, you can't, the deed you do don't equal what Jannah is. Zakallah khayl. Right. So, so, by knowing this principle, it should, it should be a catalyst for both humility and gratitude. Humility and gratitude which are two very important qualities, the, the opposite of which lead to the hellfire. Because the, the major sin of Iblis was what? From the beginning, was what? Arrogance. Kibir, exactly, arrogance. The opposite of which we're looking for, which is that humility. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, what's the opposite of gratitude? What's the opposite of shukr? Kufr, hey, kufr is the opposite of shukr, right? Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ uh, uh, mentioned uh, in an authentic hadith that the majority of he saw the fire. Uri to nar, I was shown the hellfire. Fa ida akthru ahli hanisa, the majority of the inhabitants were women. Yakfurna, the Prophet said. They commit kufr. The Prophet, they asked the Prophet Sallallahu Yakfurna Billah, they disbelieve in Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Yakfurna al Ashir. It's not 
the kufr of disbelief. It is the kufr of ingratitude, which doesn't take a person outside of the, of the hellfire. But it is a trait that if it is uh, consistent, such that a person is described as being ungrateful, right, then it can lead a person to the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the importance of showing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also to the people who do good for you. <coughs> Whoever doesn't thank the people has not thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> we stopped on page 46, uh, the translation of which says, virtue is not attained by doing a great deal of outward deeds. Mayan and Sheikh. Lam ara al ajumma bidda. Page forty six. Marat al dani. Virtue is not attained. Yes. We begin this lesson under Ustad al Doctor Tahir Watts, wa kitabuna the journey to Allah, min Ibn Majib al Hanbali rahimahullah. First paragraph reads. Virtue is not attained by doing a great deal of outward deeds. Rather, it is attained by deeds being sincere for Allah and being correct in that they are done in accordance to the sunnah and through gnosis of the heart and its actions. Right, stop there, inshallah. Uh, obviously, we're not going to stop at every single point, but there, there are some things here that are important. So, as a matter of fact, it might be good if you highlight this part. يقول رحمة الله عليه وليست الفضائل بكثرة الأعمال البدنية لكن بكونها خالصة لله عز وجل صوابا على متابعة السنة. So, so what he's saying here is that when we talk about what makes something virtuous, is it just that there's a lot going on, or is it more about the quality of the deeds that are being performed. So Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Tabarak at the, at the very beginning. How does it read? Tabarak al-ladhi biyadihi al-mulk wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Al-ladhi khalaq al-mawta wal-hayata liyabaluwakum ayyukum akthar amala. Ah, ahsan wa amala. Ayywa. Not ha... To, he's the one who created death and life to test you. As to which of you is best. Ahsan wa amalan. Best in deeds. And he did not say akhtaru amalan. Not who does the most, but who does the best. And the best, as Al Fudayl ibn Iyad, rahimahullah ta'ala says, akhlasuhu wa aswabuhu. That which is most sincere and most. Uh, and, and done the best in emulating the Prophet ﷺ in that action. So here it says, these being sincere for Allah and being correct and that they are done according to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And so, uh, again, the importance here is on sincerity and uh, emulating the Prophet ﷺ. And then it says, and also, also, be kathrati معارف القلوب وأعمالها. And I'm not I'm not sure why the the translator used the word gnosis here. Um, gnosis is the Greek word for for knowledge, right? Um, but but usually it's used for uh, spiritual uh, knowledge, if you will, right? Knowledge of spiritual things or spiritual mysteries. Um, here, this is not what it's referring to, Allahu I mean, and it's not specific to that. Ma'arif al-qulub are those things that you know, what a'mal al-qalb are the actions of, of the heart. And when we talk about actions of the heart, what do we mean? I'm sorry, say it out, say it a little louder. A tawakkul, okay, and taqwa, and what else? Okay, hope, hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What else? Fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Huh? Loving Allah. Loving Allah. Those three are the arkan of ibadah. 
uh, ibadat al qalbiyah so the, the the when we look at what are the pillars of uh, or the essential um, matters uh, of the heart that are necessary for your ibadah to be accepted love hope and fear okay so <clears throat> uh, here he says and through gnosis of the heart i need the knowledge of the heart and its actions type keep going Shaykh. Whoever has more knowledge of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, his religion and his ordinances, and has more fear, hope, and love for him, is better than one who has not attained his level. It should be this level, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Even if... No, no, no. Uh, he, he's... Uh, okay, tell you, mash. Mm. Even if the latter do more outward deeds. This understanding is derived from the hadith of Aisha, radiallahu anha, be firm, steadfast, and balanced upon which we have glad tidings. Saddidu wa qaribu. Na, wa abshiru. Na. For indeed, actions alone will not cause one to enter paradise. The most beloved deeds to Allah are those that are done continuously and persistently, even if they be few. Therefore, he ordered us to take a middle path in deeds and to add to this knowledge of the most... And to add to this, and to add to this, knowledge of the most beloved deeds to Allah. Tell you. Knowledge of the most beloved deeds to Allah. And he informed us that deeds alone will not cause one entry into paradise. All right, I want, I want us to understand something here. Why do we normally associate... Mm, like when we think about, okay, how can I be a better worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The first thing that we think about is how to do more. Right? Mm -hmm. It's normally how we think. We want to pray more. I'm going to fast more. I'm going to do this more. It, and it, it's going to come. This point, he's going to drive this point home. It's not about more as much as it is, it is about the quality of what you are doing. I'll tell you. At, at, let, let, let's let this point sink home. So he says here at the top, whoever has more knowledge of Allah, his religion, his commands, his prohibitions, he has fear, hope, and love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's going to be better than the person who's doing more than him but hasn't reached his level in, in, in that area. Tell you, why do you think that is? Why do you think that we usually associate better religiosity with outward deeds. You gotta, you gotta think about this stuff. Otherwise, uh, you're gonna miss it. Mm. Sorry? Because <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. Because people acknowledge it. Yeah, you, you get it. Other people see what you're doing and acknowledge it. Yeah, go ahead. Ustaz, what I've okay. noticed, however, is that. Writings such as this concentrate on the actions and what should be its replacement without discussing how do you get that level of internal betterment. Like, we should be doing this, we should be doing that, right, we should right, be. Right, no, no, but I haven't stick found to the it. question. Let's stick to the question. It, it's going to come. You got to finish the book. And then, if, 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 you, <laughs> What's that? if you stop halfway, then, then yeah, you're right. You're not going to get there. Let's finish the book. But, It'll tell you how to get there, inshallah. That's, that's what the book is for. But the question is, why do we normally think about more? And what do we do about that? Go ahead. I mean, it's, it's a, uh, we've created to want more. Uh, more. Okay. Because you know I mean? it's kind of like part of our DNA to want more. Hmm. That we think more in Go ahead. Also, we, 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 we tend to think that if we do more, we'll get more, more benefit. Okay, so so we, we kind of associate the, the more with the benefit. So the more you do this, the more you'll get in reward. Okay, I, to the right? sorry, pertaining to the knowledge that you know about what you're trying to do more of. Okay, a uh, like condition for productivity. Like but I, I'll make it easy, I, and Allah knows best. The, the reason why we, why we usually go for more is because it's easy to count, you, you just can feel it like. It's different. How, how do you know you've grown in taqwa? So, so you start off the beginning of Ramadan, right? right? And, and the idea is I'm going to grow in, in taqwa. Like, 
on the Eid, can you look back at the beginning and say, yeah, my, my tuckle was, you know, at, uh, you know, 40% before Ramadan, and now I'm at 70%. Can you do that? It's, it's very hard to, to measure. And, and we're, looking for me we're, we're looking for measurable things, right? So you can know that you didn't used to pray duha, and now you pray duha. You didn't used to pray witzer, and now you pray witzer, and you feel like you've accomplished something. And so a lot of times, that's what we're looking. We're looking for a feeling of accomplishment. And that's, that's also a little scary in some ways because yeah, just don't, don't take this the wrong way, but are we looking to please ourselves? Or are we looking to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? So I feel good about myself huh? because I'm praying more. I feel good about myself but am I really growing through that process or not? So it, the, the, there's a recommendation, right? And that is, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. It's, it's nothing wrong with feeling good about doing better if what you're doing is pleasing to a loss of hand time. There's nothing wrong with that. But you can't let that take the place of, for example, pondering over the ayat in the Quran that are instructing us to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Pondering over those ayat in the Quran that want us to have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reading books on tawakkul, listening to lessons on tawakkul. Those, and why is this? Because there's, there's nothing, right, in terms of prescription that you do to grow in fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or grow in hope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the things that you actually have to work in in a different way. Like, okay, so for example, uh, the class that Sheikh Abu Muhammad did on, on Tawakkul. Like, you, you came to the class, you listened to the lessons, and then it's over, and then four years down the line, and you haven't gone back, and you haven't listened to it again. No, those are the type of things that that should be a part, again, like we talked about this book being part of your routine. There's nothing wrong with going over that once a year. Just to remind yourself. Tawakkul. And when you talk about ummahat al-ibadat al-qalbiyah, yani the major ibadat of the heart, you're talking about love, fear, hope. Tawakkul will be right there. Right? So you're looking at those. How, how do you incorporate uh, those readings right, into what you do on a regular basis because there's no, the, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't stop. Salat al Fajr stops. So there's a specific time for it. And then there's no salat that you have to do until dhuhr. Then it's done. And there's no salat that you have to do until. I, so there, there's specific times for those. When does the love of Allah stop? Never. When does the hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stop? When does the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stop? When does tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stop? Those things don't stop. Right? And so you have to constantly be reminded of those ibadat. And it's, again, inshallah, as we go through this book, you'll, you'll hear this being, constant, being mentioned over and over again. The other last point that I want to mention here, inshallah ta'ala, right, maybe I should ask it as a question. Why is a tasdeed and al muqaraba or hitting the target or coming close to that target? Why is that mentioned in the same hadith as none of you will enter Jannah by way of his actions? Which is what the author is talking about right now. Why, why is it in the same hadith? Now, go ahead. Because even though you won't enter Jannah due to your actions, mm. your actions determine whether you're worthy, worthy of Allah's mercy. Tight. So, so in other words, even though Jannah uh, cannot be attained, by your actions independently, you still got to do something, right? You still, the Prophet like Sallam here, it, it, we should not misunderstand the hadith as you don't have to do anything. So the Prophet like Sallam is saying still, strive your hardest, try to hit the bullseye. If you can't hit that, then come close and know that even with that, even if you do your best, you, you don't deserve Jannah by your actions, Okay. And it, it, your actions alone are not going to, to get you into gender. But don't leave off working. Work hard. Work hard but, and travel a middle course. 
in that. Be moderate, right? Even even in your striving, be be moderate. Play it, fella. Therefore, I think I th I th it's for it is for this reason. <laughs> it is for this. That's how it was for me. <laughs> it is for this reason that some of the Salaf said. Abu Bakr an, did not outstrip you by virtue of much fasting or prayer, but rather, but rather because of something that had taken root in his heart. Some, some of them said, what was in the heart of Abu Bakr? An? What was in the heart of Abu Bakr was the love of Allah and, and sincerity and sincer and sincerity to his servants. No. So <clears throat> Uh, this uh, statement is attributed to Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anh, and, and, and others. Um, and that is that uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anh, maybe there were people who fasted more than Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Maybe there were people who prayed more than Abu Bakr as Siddiq. But none of them were better than Abu Bakr as Siddiq. In fact, the Prophet wasalam, said that if the Iman of Abu Bakr was weighed against the Iman of the Ummah, then the Iman of Abu Bakr will outweigh the Iman of the rest of the Ummah. So, was the issue a Salat by itself or fasting? They said no, it was something that was in his heart. And then others said that that which was in his heart was the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the nasiha, right, being truthful to the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you, when you read the, the biography of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, what becomes apparent is that, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but that what was in his heart was the, the true emulation and following of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like his, his following of the Prophet was second to none. I mean, even in his speech, you look at Sulh al hudaybiyah uh, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu to write down the terms of the agreement with the mushrikeen. And it looked really bad for the Muslims. I mean, it looked like, looked like, we were, like the Muslims were giving in because the mushrikeen said, look, if anybody comes to you from Mecca, then you got to turn them back. And if anybody comes from you all to Mecca, then, you don't, then we don't have to turn them back. And all of these other conditions that they laid out. <clears throat> Who was like furious about that? Omar. Omar radiallahu anh. Furious. And he went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, didn't Allah put us on the truth? And them people's on bottle. And what, since, since when have we been like the type to just humiliate ourselves in the deen? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, yeah, Omar, inni Rasulullah. I'm the messenger of Allah. Like in other words, this is not from me. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa innahu nasiru. Nasiri. And indeed Allah is going to make me victorious. He's my nasir. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who was still not satisfied, was still upset. You know how you go, you complain to, to, the, to the big guy. Then it's just like, man, he's not listening. I'm going to go to somebody else. Maybe he can talk to him. So who did Omar go to after the Prophet Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu anh. And he went and he was like, Abu Bakr, aren't we on the haq? And they on Baltimore? And since when are we going to humiliate ourselves? And what did Abu Bakr say? Exactly what the Prophet said. He said, he said, in the Rasulullah. When Allah and And he looked at even to his speech, how he, he didn't even know that he was emulating the Prophet Sallallahu but that's how much he was in tune with the Prophet And so the, the, the Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he, his iman, and he was only second to the iman of the Prophet and he was in line with the teachings of the Prophet on everything. Now. Next page? No. Wherever, wherever you st stop the... Some of the Gnostics said... So, okay, okay, again, we're dealing with this term Gnosis, Gnostics, and so forth. So, just so that you know... Okay, what do we say Gnosis is? Spiritual knowledge. Gnosis is knowledge. The, the, the Gnostics, and it, here it has a capital G, 
uh, as if it's referring to a specific group. So that usually refers to a group of Christian mystics. Um, so, th so translating Arifin, which is what he's translating uh, in, in the Arabic language, the, the Arif is a, is a term that is more commonly used by Ahl uh, Tasawwuf. Okay. It's more commonly used by them to talk about their scholars. So where most people would just talk about the ulama, and they call about the ulama, they would say call about the arifin, because they're talking about some scholars of tasawwuf. And we've mentioned many different times, and tasawwuf has various forms. If we're talking about early tasawwuf, then it is closer to what we would call today tezkiyah, which is this purification of the soul. Uh, as it gets later, uh, seventh and eighth century hijri, then it begins to take on a different form where there's a sheikh at the head of uh, you know, each Sufi path and it gets uh, uh, a lot more into just, not just um, uh, tezkiyah to nafs, but very specific uh, forms of dhikr and, and ibadah that were not legislated by the Prophet So in any event, uh, some of the Gnostics, if he just says some of the, the scholars of Tezkiah said, for example, instead of Gnostics. Now, some of the Gnostics said, none who reached the heights did so through a great deal of fasting and prayer. Rather, through generosity of soul, soundness of heart, and sincerity to the nation. Yani to the Ummah. Sincerity to the Ummah. Now, some added and censure of their own souls. <laughs> One of them said that the difference in their ranking lay in their objectives and intent, not in a great deal of fasting. Okay, so prayer. right there, their objectives and intentions. Okay, it, objectives and intentions. So the author is about to switch gears and talk about the importance of intention. An intention is an internal act or an external act? Internal. It's internal, right. So he's focusing again on the actions of the heart, okay? And why intention is so important. Yeah, go ahead. The long life of the children of Israel and their great efforts in worship was mentioned to Abu Sulaiman, to which he said, Allah wants from you only a truthful intention for what lies with him, or words to that effect. Mm -hmm. Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu an, said to his companions, you fast and pray more than the companions of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, but they were better than you. They asked, how so? He replied, they were more abstinent of this world than you and more desirous of the hereafter. Okay, so put, put, put like a circle around that. And then this next explanation of this by Ibn Rajib, uh, if this is what you walk away with today, then it's sufficient. <laughs> listen, listen, listen real quick. When, when the students of Ibn Mas'ud asked him, okay, if we're fasting more, praying more than the companions themselves, right? I mean, even if you look at the ibadah of the, like, Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, it, it, was, it was rare that he would pray less than 200 rakats in a day, right? It was rare. But was Imam Ahmad better than companions of the Prophet, I just to say, absolutely not, hmm. Okay. Even though that would be rare, like if you, when you read the bi biographies of the campaigns, it's not normal that you're going to find one of them praying 200 rakats in a day. And even the Prophet, I didn't like to say, you don't find that to be uh, the norm. The Prophet, but that was the norm of Imam Ahmed, Rahmatullah. So he's saying, Ibn Mas'ud is saying to his students, you fast and you pray more than the companions of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. I and mean, when you look at the norm of the campaigns of the Prophet Sallallahu their norm was uh, uh, three times uh, a month right, that, that they would fast. That was, that was the norm of the campaigns of the Prophet And some of them, maybe you'll find that they're fasting every Monday. Some of them maybe Mondays and Thursdays. You can, if you look at the campaigns that fast, the fast of Dawood, that's not normal for the campaigns of the Prophet Sallallahu But maybe some of the Tabi'een, yeah, you'll find them. So he's saying you fast more than they did, you pray more. But they're still better than you. They said, how? How's that? Can as had the minkum fi dunya wa arghaba fil akhirah. It's about their hearts. It's about the heart. And this is what he's gonna stress over and over again as we go. 
they were less attached to the world than you are and more desirous of the hereafter. Less attached to the dunya and more wanting of the hereafter. Tayyip, keep going. Hence, Hence, he indicated that the superiority of the companions in the attachment of their hearts to the hereafter, their desire for it, their turning away from this world, and their thinking little of it, even if it be readily available to them. Their hearts were empty of the world and filled with the hereafter. This is what they inherited from the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. He, alayhi salatu wasalam, was one whose heart was most devoid of the world and most attached to Allah and the abode of the hereafter. This, despite his outwardly interacting with the creation, fulfilling the duties of prophethood, and implementing the politics of the religion and world. Implementing the politics of the religion and, and world uh, doesn't capture the meaning uh, as well as, uh, okay, fulfilling the duties of prophethood and managing religious and worldly affairs, okay? Uh, politics doesn't really fit here. Even though, I mean, the word in Arabic is siyasa, but, but siyasa here is, is not talking about politics as we know politics, but more about the management of, of the religious and worldly affairs of the people. So again, again, you can highlight. Hence, he indicated, that is, Ibn Masr indicated that the superiority of the companions lay in the attachment of their hearts to the hereafter, their desire for it, their turning away from this world, and their thinking little of it, even if it be readily available to them. Uh, the ten who were promised paradise from the companions of the Prophet in the single hadith, and the, the most prominent of the Prophet Sallallahu companions. I mean, four of them were known to be rich, like very wealthy. Uthman ibn Affan, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, Zubair ibn Awam, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, radiallahu ta'ala anhum. And Abu Bakr also was, yeah. was known, not, not as much wealth as, as those. But they were promised Jannah. Because the dunya was where? It was in their hands. It wasn't in their hearts. There are people who have no dunya in their hands. Poor. Yet, it's all in their heart. They want it so bad. And they have none of it. Right? So, but for them, they had the dunya in their hands. But it wasn't in their hearts. And so Allah Azza wa Jalla. Yani, does, nobody is blameworthy for being wealthy. Being wealthy is a good thing if you can use your wealth to for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and, and for that reason, you may recall a hadith of the companions uh, who were sitting around one day and then they complained to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they said, oh, the, the, the wealthy from amongst us have gone away with all the ajr. Right? They, they, uh, they pray the way we pray, they fast the way we fast, but then they, they spend in charity. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't get to spend in charity. And so that's when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi taught them to make those ethkar after salah. Right? And that nobody would have more than them on the day of judgment, except for somebody who came with its like or more than those ethkar. So he's teaching them to, to make this dhikr. But the point was, their wealth, their wealth was not seen as something that was that was blameworthy. In fact, the, the other mm -hmm. companions were saying, look. They, they get more reward than we get because they, they're able to give sadaqah and we're not able to give sadaqah. And the, point, the point is that the companions of the Prophet it, it was about their hearts being attached to, to the hereafter, even though they had wealth, or many of them had wealth in their hands. And if you look at the ten that were promised gender, none of them were known to be poor. No. Yes, right. Father. This was the state of the khulafa who came after him and those who followed them in goodness. Who came after him, yani, who came after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No. And those who followed them in the goodness. Them, the them refers to who? To the Khulafa. Them. Him refers to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And those who followed them, them refers to the Khulafa. No. Thank you. In goodness, such as Al Hassan and Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. There were in their times those who fasted more than them and prayed more than them.
but their hearts had not attained the levels of theirs in terms of leaving the world and turning to the hereafter and settling there. In other words, turning to, the, he says, leaving the world, yani traveling away from the dunya and becoming citizens of the hereafter. Okay? So th this, is, this is what he's focusing on. And how do you do that? You do that again by having a healthy regimen of reading about the hereafter, listening to lectures about the hereafter. Uh, you, you find, for example, when we went over right? There, there's, uh, there are things that we covered in there that as you go through it, subhanAllah, you can, it's almost like you can feel going through those stages. You can feel being asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having your deeds weighed, walking across the sirat, and so on and so forth, right? Knowing about the hereafter is very important. Any question, Shaykh? Would, would it be possible to say then that you know, when we look at ayat number, chapter number 3, verse 31, and he's talking about the civilians, what comes to mind is following him in his actions. But we're also talking about trying to follow him in terms of knowledge too, and not to... Put that part Ahsant. Not a part of the Ahsant. Uh, so Sheikh Hanif is mentioning here is in in Ali Imran, Surah Ali Imran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Quote, In kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni. If you love Allah, then follow me. Yuhbibukum Allah, yakfir lakum dunubukum Allah will love you and he forgive you for your sins. That the following of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam is is not just in the actions of the Prophet And this is also, this is well known when we think about, uh, if we just take it a little deeper, the, there are people who stood, they, they prayed better than, than any of us ever could. They stood directly behind the Prophet and they prayed, but were they following the Prophet? Hmm. If you love Allah, follow me. Type Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. You know who that was? Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. He, he was the chief of the hypocrites. Did he pray behind the Prophet Yes. Yeah. I mean, he could follow the Prophet better than any of us could. It's impossible for us to, to follow the Prophet in that sense, like he did. He was right behind him. He prayed just like he prayed. But was he following the Prophet? No. Nah. Nah. Only externally. And so our following of the Prophet is not just external, it's not limited to the external following of the Prophet. We're trying to follow him in the khushur that he had in his salat, in the intention that he had for his salat. In the in the and if he Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and in magnifying Allah. And all of that, which means that we need to try to gain the knowledge that the Prophet ﷺ had. We're not going to reach the level, of, nobody can reach the level of a Prophet because a Prophet is directly getting revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But by studying the revelation, by learning more about it, then you come closer to being a true follower of the Prophet All right, so here where he says, Lam yasil qalbuhu ila ma ilayhi Right? Here, the author is emphasizing the points that have proceeded in the, in the previous paragraphs about the heart being the crux of the matter. And also, also, uh, it tempers the, the kibir and the arrogance that may accompany the hearts of the people who are doing more ibadah as they look at those who aren't doing as much as them. Because that is a recipe for looking down on others that aren't doing as much. So this begins to temper that because the issue is one of the heart and you don't know what's in that person's heart. Nah. Number 3.1, a noble principle? Yes. The best of people are those who traverse the path of the Prophet 
and the elite of his companions, radiallahu anhu, such that they are moderate in the bodily actions of worship and strive to correct the affairs and states of the heart. All right, so I, I, even though this is a, a decent translation, I don't know that, it, that, it, that the point is actually caught. He's saying here that the, that the way of the Prophet, and the companions, right, is that they were moderate, in terms of their bodily acts of ibadah, their outward, external acts of ibadah, but they had ishtihad fil ahwal al qalbi. They really worked hard when it came to matters of the heart. And I, I don't know that that came out in the, uh, in the translation. Or, or was that already clear from the translation? Yeah, okay. So. He says, فَأَفْضَلُ النَّاسِ مَنْ سَلَقَ طَرِيقَ النَّبِيَ عَلَيْهِ الصلاة والسلام وَخَوَاصِ أَصْحَابِهِ فِي الْإِقْتِصَادِ فِي الْعِبَادَةِ الْبَدَنِيَةِ وَالْإِجْتِهَادِ فِي الْأَحْوَالِ الْقَلْبِيَةِ Okay? So, they were moderate in their external acts of worship, but they worked really hard as it relates to the actions and the states of the heart. All right? طيب. Now, this is because... This is because the journey to the hereafter... It's cut short by the journey of the hearts. Okay, I'm not sure cut short, short words here, but let's say is, is only accomplished by the heart's journey. No, not the physical journey. Not the journey of the bodies. Clear? Then, clear, is that clear? So again, why is he saying that they work so hard on their hearts? It's because this journey that we're talking about to the hereafter is one that is done by the heart. Okay? And so that's where they put the, that's where they put that focus. Now, a man came. A man came to one of the Nazis. Scholars. Mm. A man came to one of the scholars and said, I have journeyed long and hard to reach you. He replied, this matter is not about arduous journeys. Rather, with one step, Distance your lower self from you, and then will you find the accomplishment of your objective. All right. So this is this is difficult to translate, but so so what what's happening here? What did you understand from what you just read? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> the man uh, he made it uh, seem or appear to be a big deal because he made this far distant journey okay and the man that he was talking to so 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 you took so the student goes to the scholar yes student is making it like this is a really big deal I've, I've traveled so hard i've traveled so long i had to come this great distance and conquer all types of things just to make it to you so this is the big deal right and the scholar and the scholar replies but what and i think that the scholar is saying um it's better that you should have concentrated on what you was doing uh, during the journey uh, as opposed to the journey itself. Okay, okay. Anybody else? You, you definitely in the ballpark. Yeah, go ahead. So, along the lines of that, the student was speaking about how long his journey was, mm. and the scholar then says to him, distance your lower self, meaning your nefs, mm -hmm. like bring that lower than you, because he's like essentially bragging by saying, this is a long, long journey. Yeah. He's saying, you know, lower your nets. I focus on the All right. So, so this, this man is talking about a long distance, right? And the, and the scholar is telling him it's not about long distances, right? He's saying just distance yourself from your nuffs. Your nuffs getting in the way. Distance yourself from your nuffs. Think, here you can think of nuffs as ego if you like. Okay. Take one step away from your ego and you've accomplished your, you've accomplished your mission. All, all of these long, you have the long travel from here to go all the way over there. Not, all you need to do is just take one step away from your nuts. Get out of your own way, as we might say. Get out of your own way. And you, you'll, you'll have accomplished your goal. Okay? That's the easiest way. Uh, I can explain it. Father Sheikh. Abu Zaid. Said, so this is, this is not Abu Zaid, it's Abu, Abu Yazid, Bistami. Abu Yazid? Yeah. Abu Yazid said, I saw the Lord of Might in a dream, and I asked him, My Lord, 
How does one traverse the path to you? He replied, abandon yourself. Yani your nafs. Abandon your nafs. <laughs> and, come, yeah. mm -hmm. and come with welcome. Utruk nafsak wa ta'a. Yani how, how do I, how, what's, the, what's the path to you, ya Rabb? Utruk nafsak wa ta'a. Get, get rid of your nafs, the, all those things that, the, you, that, that pull you back, your ego, the, this, and, 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 and then come. Now, again, these are, these are, as I've mentioned on several occasions, Ibn Rajib, rahimahullah, uh, does not have a problem after he's established his point in mentioning narrations that may not be as sound as the other narrations. Abu Yazid al Bistami was uh, from the early scholars of, of Tasawwuf. And as for seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a dream, seeing Allah azza wa jal in a dream. Hmm. Tayy. Yeah, without going too far, uh, too deep, the, the ulama have a difference of opinion about whether Allah Azza wa Jal can be seen in a dream. The majority of the scholars say that that is not possible. Due to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where he said, none of you will see Allah Azza wa Jal until he dies. None of you will see Allah until he dies. Other scholars responded. They say, but sleep is like, is like death. Sleep is like death. So it's possible. This is the opinion of Shaykh Hussain Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, that it's possible to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a dream. However, however, he says, what, you, what you've seen, whatever you see in your dream, is you're not seeing Allah Azza wa Jal like the one who see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. And there's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whatever it is that you're seeing, whatever it is that you think you're seeing, you might be hearing this or whatever the situation may be. But again, none of this is legislation. Uh, so you can't take this and change. Like, for example, you, you'll, you'll find some people, they say, well, you know, uh, Allah told me in a dream, I, I don't have to pray five times anymore. I, I've made it already. I've made it to the level of yaqeen. Wa'abud uh, rabbak. Worship your Lord until Yaqeen comes to you. And Allah told me in a dream I reached the level of Yaqeen. I don't have to pray five times anymore. That's batil. That is absolutely false. And what they was hearing was shaitan. And somebody needs to remind them that I mean, the Prophet reached all types of levels of Yaqeen. And he prayed more than five times a day. And until he died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in any event. <clears throat> yeah, we, we don't need to go too far into to, to that particular issue. Um, but again, there is difference, and it's differing as amongst Ahlul Sunnah themselves, scholars of Ahlul Sunnah, and each one of them has their evidence. And the strongest opinion seems to be, with Allah Ta'ala Adam, that nobody will see Allah Azza wa Jal uh, even in their dreams until, uh, and nobody will see Allah Azza wa Jal until after they die. Nah, nah. No nation. One has second, been... one second. So how do we treat this, this, this authority? Like, I mean, if someone comes to us or when we read, you know, um, books of this nature, when we see these type of authority, how are we to treat them? Yeah, you just... كُلٌّ يُتْرَكْ مِنْ قَوْلِهِ وَيُرَدْ إِلَّا النَّبِيَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ Everybody's statement can be taken and rejected. What do you, and for that reason, it's, it's important to develop a, a healthy reading of what we read. That to, to know just that, subhanAllah, uh, you know, Shaykh al-Islam and Taymiyyah rahmatullah when he talks about the firqa to and, and, and who is actually the safe sect, they're those who, their imam is only the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Everybody else's statement is subject to being investigated, except for the statement of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So when you investigate a statement, there's no human being. After Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that after investigating their statements, that you're going to find some things that maybe agree or maybe disagree. I mean, with the, you know, with, with the sharia. So in, the, in this case, it's, again, the scholars differ about whether somebody can see Allah's wa in dreams or not. Abu Yazid al Bastami, anyway, is not a. Mm, yeah, I mean, he's not he's not from the 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 scholars that Ahl Sunnah 
يعني, look to as the saying, this is a alim from the ulama of Ahl sunnah He's not from those types. And just because somebody happened to live, you know, in the second century, the third century, the fourth century, just because somebody happened to live during that time, doesn't mean that everything that they said was, was correct, even though they lived at the time of the Salaf. No. no nation has been given what this nation has been given, and that by virtue of its following and, its and, prophet. And that is by virtue, even though uh, the, the is is uh, omitted and should be there. That is by virtue. No. Of its following its prophet, alayhi salatu wa salam. He was the best of creation, and his guidance was the best of guidance. Through him, Allah made the religion easy, and through him, he unburdened his nation of many a hardship and difficulty. Whoever obeys him has obeyed Allah and followed his guidance, and he will, in turn, love him. Right. And so, the blessing, or the barakah, of this ummah is by virtue of the members of this ummah following the way of the Prophet ﷺ, whose way was the best guidance. Ibn Rajab is then going to give us examples of this barakah. Okay? So he starts to talk about how, uh, and where does this come from, by the way? Why, why is he even talking about this in the first place? Why is he talking about the way of the Prophet being the, 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 this ummah? Uh, yani it gets his barakah from following the Prophet Sallallahu His way was the easy way. And then here's some examples of this ease and barakah. Why is he talking about that? Yeah. We're just talking about the quality over the quantity. Quality over quantity. Okay. Keep going. Let's get me closer. Huh. And uh, through like what he's about to mention, um, it kind of shows the, the mercy True mercy that Allah has had on his own. All right, I don't want you to forget in the in the very beginning of this book, the author starts out with one hadith. But how many different ways does he narrate it? Four. All right. So you go back to the beginning. Two on the authority of Abu Huraira, and two on the authority of who? Aisha radiAllahu taala anha. And in some of the wordings. In the had the dina yusrun. This deen is easy, right? That's part of the, 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 the wording of the hadith. And Ibn Rajab's objective in, the, in this book is to do what? Explain the hadith. And so now he's going to talk about some of this ease. Some of this ease. Now, the ease of the religion. Now, some examples of the ease that resulted through his blessings is that the one who prays Aisha in congregation it is as if he has play, prayed half the night and the one who prays Fajr in congregation it is as if he has prayed the whole night Tayyip, stop there Tayyip, uh, this hadith uh, look in the footnote who narrated the hadith hmm it's really not fair, but where is it collected and what? In Sahih Muslim. Okay. Okay. In that hadith, يعني, he, he mentions that the Prophet said, Man salla al-isha fi jama'a fa ka'annama salla uh, nisf al-layl. Whoever prays isha in jama'a is as if he's prayed half the night. Whoever prays fajr in jama'a is as if he's prayed the entire night. <coughs> so does that mean that salat al-fajr that the reward for praying Salat al-Fajr and Jama'ah is twice the reward for praying Salat al-Isha and Jama'ah. Hmm? No? Taib, how, how would you come to a conclusion? Yeah, go ahead. So if you pray Isha, then that's half the night. And if you pray Fajr, then that's the other half of the night. So praying them together is like praying a full night. That's that's what you say? Yes. Is that what the Prophet said in this hadith? Well, no, I said the hadith appears. Not How will we come to a conclusion? Yes. Open up a shah. Open up a shah. Okay. Ah, right, Shaykh. Jam at Turu. That's what I really want you to get at. So, Men lam yajma turuk al hadith lam yafham. 
If you don't gather the various narrations of the hadith, then you won't understand it. Right? All right. So when you get when you gather the narrations of the hadith and you come across the, the narration of a Tirmidhi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, says that the Prophet said, whoever prays Isha, fi jama'ah, that's as if he's praying half the night. And whoever prays Isha and Fajr and Jama'ah, mm-hmm. right? and so whoever prays Isha and Fajr and Jama'ah, it's as if he's prayed the entire night. Mm-hmm. Right? So from there, we, yani, the, the best understanding of this is that uh, yani, Isha is half the night and Fajr is half the night. Right, from from gathering the total, even though some of the ulama, some of the ulama go on and they explain why fajr is actually, yani more more rewar- fajr and jama'ah is more rewarding than salat al isha, and there's no doubt that salat al fajr is better than salat al isha. There's no doubt about that, and we'll come across some of that as we go along, inshallah. Now, hence, the night prayer is recorded. Wait, let me let me ask you something. Why do you think he's talking about? Why do you think he's talk- showing us? Some of the things that are easy, it, I say easy with an ain, yeah, that are easy to do. <laughs> uh, why do you think he's talking about that? To intergender, you don't need to make it difficult on yourself. Uh, okay. Okay. Huh? Yeah, because he's talking about, see, so, because this whole chapter he's dealing with consistency, right? And normally, things that you find easy to do or easier, Right, you'll be more likely to be consistent with those things that you find easier to do. Right, and then on top of that, if you know the great reward that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has attached to these things, then you're more likely to do them, and they're not that difficult. Now, does it mean like right now when Salat al Isha is ten fifteen at night, Salat al Fajr is three fifty five in the morning? Does it mean that it's just easy to do? No, it's going to be seasons where it's easier. Seasons where it's more difficult, right? But if you develop the consistency, you develop that habit, then be idni lahi ta'ala al qasta al qasta tablughu. That's what the Prophet said. Moderation, moderation, you're going to reach your destination. Bidni lahi, right? So look to those things. And this is, Ibn Rajab is telling us here look, pay attention to these things. Do this. Make sure you do that. So don't, we, not, we shouldn't just be reading these things for the sake of reading them, but for learning, okay, yeah, I need to implement that. Need to implement. This is the journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And instead of going and doing a whole bunch of other things, right, that may or may not even be legislated, do these things here that the Prophet like something legislated and where you can get a lot of reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for now. Mm. Hence the night prayer is recorded for him while he lies asleep on his bed, and more so if he goes to sleep in a state of purity and remains in the remembrance of Allah until his eyes close. Yeah, look at that. Even though he's sleep in his bed. Yuktab lahu qiyamu lay. And it's, it's being written for him that he prayed the night. Why? Because he prayed Isha and Jama'ah and he prayed Fajr and Jama'ah. Faka'annama qama layla kulla. It's like he prayed the entire night. It's being written for even though he's doing what? Sleep. Even though he's sleep. Right? Now, it doesn't mean he shouldn't pray during the night as, we, as we'll cover. And then he talks about you know, the importance of, of going to bed upon in a state of in a state of purity, the Prophet ﷺ said in the Hadith of Al Barab in Azib, you can go back to Sahih Bukhari, the 247th Hadith, Sahih Bukhari. You should add that there because I don't think it's in the footnotes. I don't remember it being there. Huh? Shalom. What's the What's the one in the footnotes? You said 3048. La la, 247. Barab in Azib. What's it say in the footnotes? Taib, iqra, iqra. Sure. It doesn't have just the number. Ah, okay. Taib. Hadith al-Bara'a atayta madja'ak He said that the Prophet ﷺ said to him Ida atayta madja'ak yani If you go If you're going to lay down and go to sleep Fatawadda wudu'aka Lissalah Make wudu as you would for your For your salah Some of the ulama They, they mention that you want to make a, a A full wudu Like you would do uh, for your prayer where, as opposed to the khafif, yani sometimes a person might just, um, yani they don't want tahara because they want to read the Quran, for example. So you just do one time instead of like the, the three times like they would do for the salah. And it's all tahara at the end of the day. 
فتوضا وضوءك للصلاة ثم اتجع على شقك الأيمن and then lay down on your, your right side ثم قل اللهم أسلمت وجهي إليك to the end of the dua so lay down your right side and then say oh Allah I have, I have submitted my face to you وفوضت أمري إليك and I have uh, resigned my affairs to you to the end of it's a, it's a somewhat of a long dua no. whoever fasts three months three days of every month it is if he has fasted for the whole, fasted the whole month. Why is that? Because each day, huh, every good deed that he does is, is multiplied ten times or more. Right? So three days is as if he has fasted. Thirty days. Even though he's eating. Even though he's eating. So it's It's like you fast the entire month, and whoever fasts the entire month, every month, then it's as if he has fasted his entire month. Life. Now, Bukhari Muslim. Now, hence, hence, he is regarded to be fasting the remaining days of the month in the record of Allah, even though he is eating, and the one who is eating and grateful has the reward of the one who is patiently fasting. Allah Akbar. Who at, who and, and, and what does that show you? It shows you the power of intention, the power of the actions of the heart. Now, follow. Whoever has the intention of waking up to pray by night, but is overcome by sleep, will have the reward of the night prayer recorded for him. And that sleep of his would be a charity from Allah. That, of course, that's not, that, a person can't just do that every single night. Like, yeah, I had the intention, you know, for a year straight, and he never gets up, right? But, yeah, I need the person who, who has a normal habit, they, they, they worship Allah's Ta'ala at night, and then, you know, occasionally, they they intended to get up, but it didn't. You know, it didn't work. Then, inshallah, they get with the in the and manoa. I mean, everybody will have that which they intend to be the light time. Now, Abu Darudat radiallahu an said, "Excellent indeed is the sleep of the intelligent person, and their breaking of the fast. Look, look how they outstrip the night vigil and the fasting of the obtuse." Mm -hmm. What's obtuse mean, Shane? That's uh people are thick, can't really <laughs> learn. <laughs> Do we say that in American English thick? Do we say that? Yeah. That's I thought that was British uh, yeah. specific. Uh, it's thick. hard to get through. It's another it's a form of it, it, it's it's a nice way to say stupid, Shake. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um so Abu Dardin is again, he's 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 comparing the, the intelligent right but 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 here intelligent doesn't just mean somebody who's like um you know uh like you would describe as being a genius or something like that uh, what he's talking about is the is the people who have learned how to correct their intentions my lost parents i always leave right so uh these are people who when how how could it be possible but that they sleep but they outdo the person who's who stayed awake? How, how's that even possible? Hmm. By the intention. Right. So with some of them mentioned, for example, let's just say somebody uh, prays, the, pr prays the beginning of the night and they pray four rakats and they're tired and they go to sleep and they, their intention is to wake up before Salat al-Fajr by, you know, half hour and they're going to pray some more. And then they don't actually wake up until they're there in the Fajr. But it's still written for them that they, that they prayed. Right, um, and so because of their intentions, the intentions turn normal things that they would normally do into acts of ibadah, which is why Mu'adh radiAllahu taala anhu he said in the ahtasibu nomati kama ahtasibu qawmati, and he, I, I seek reward in my sleep, the the way that I, I, I seek reward by being awake and, and worshiping Allah in PM, because my sleep. I mean, again, these things, it takes time, and it takes uh, practice, it takes reminders, right? Don't just go to bed because you're, sleep, because you're sleepy, but go to bed because you want to wake up and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, with some level of, of vigor. I want to bed, I say, I want to bed now. Not, not just because I'm dead tired, worked hard all day, I did this and I did that. 
I'm going to bed because I want to wake up and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a totally different ajr in your sleep. And all it is is what? Tension. It's intention. It's not, you, you actually, there's nothing physically different about that sleep and that sleep. But the intention is different. And this is why Abu Darda, you know, he says, yeah, habba da nawma lak yes. Yani, look, look at how excellent the sleep is of these intelligent people. And yani, whose, whose intentions and their fitr, in, in fact, and, and when they eat. Nah. Father Shaykh. It is for this reason that the authentic hadith mentions it is well possible that one who prays by night gets nothing from it, save or accept weariness. And a person fasting gets nothing from it, save hunger and thirst. Recorded by Tabarani wa Ahmed. Rahimahullah. Rahimahullah. Someone said... By, by the way, that, that's... Um, let me see something real quick. <coughs> I don't think that uh, I don't think that Ibn Rajab wrote that like that. It doesn't. It just just as a as a side note, you, you never put Tabarani before Ahmed. Yeah. Because right. number one, because Ahmed's book is more um, prestigious, and number two, chronologically, Tabarani was uh, Imam Ahmed died in two. Forty-one, and Tabarani was over a, cent over a century later, three sixty, if I'm not mistaken. For for your I don't I don't have it. So, yeah, uh, yeah. So that that's from the muhakkik, I guess. As for Ibn Rajab, I, I would never expect for him to say Rawahu Tabarani wa Ahmed. The same way you wouldn't say it was narrated by Tirmidhi and Bukhari. You'd never do that. Bukhari and then Tirmidhi. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. You had a question? Well, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Azmi pointed that out. He said, and you can check it out by reading Ibn Kathir. He will always put Imam Ahmed Rahimullah first. Well, well that, there's a different reason why Ibn Kathir used to do that. And that's because Ibn Kathir, Rahmatullah uh, alayhi, it's as if he memorized the Musnad of Imam Ahmed. So Ibn Kathir would actually mention the Riwayah of Ahmed even if it was in Bukhari Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's for a different reason. Okay. Fadl or Lila? Nah, someone said. Someone said, many are the ones seeking forgiveness, but their lot is anger. And many are the ones who are silent, but their lot is mercy. The first. Seeks forgiveness, yet his heart remains the heart of a rebellious sinner. So he's just saying, stuck for the law with his tongue, right? But his heart is not, his, his heart is not into it, yeah. And the second remains silent, but his heart is engrossed, or engrossed in the remembrance of the law, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is why you may see someone, subhanAllah, their tongue is not moving, but their eyes are, are you know, are wet. They're crying. Because their hearts, you know, are engaged in the remembrance of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Another said, the issue is not about praying by night. Rather, the issue is, is of one who sleeps on his bed but awakes having outstripped the vanguard. In this regard, it has been said, what have I to do with your faltering journey? Walk with ease and at the fore will you be. In other words, a person may... Uh, may, may, may walk may, may, as a person who walks consistently may beat the one who who runs inconsistently uh, the tortoise and the hare uh, type of story now nah. oh okay keep going Sheikh. bismillah chapter four absolutely the meaning of the beginning of the day the end of the day and a portion of the latter part of the night all right so now we've talked about different uh, principles that we should abide to, we've, we, uh, by, uh, abide by. We've talked about uh, moderation, doing things in moderation, looking for the ease in the Sharia and implementing that. Now the author wants us to, to learn what's the best time. So we talked about the best deeds, right? Which are what? Those done most consistently, even if they are few. And it is an issue of the heart. Not just that you're doing a whole lot of things. 
Well, now, what about the best times to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's what he's going to talk about here. Now. His, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saying, journey to Allah in the beginning of the day, the end of the day, and a portion of the latter part of the night. Has the meaning of his, alayhi salatu wa salam, saying in, in other narrations, seek help, and seek help in this by journeying to Allah at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, and a portion of the latter part of the night. All right, so the words in Arabic are al ghadwa al-rawha, and al-dulja, right? al ghadwa wa rawha and al-dulja. No. The meaning of this is that these three periods are times of journeying to Allah through performing actions of obedience. Right, 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 right. So these three times are super important. Al-Ghadwa, which is the beginning of the day. al rawha which is the end of the day. Al-Dulja, which is that latter portion of the night. Now, uh, according to it, what Ibn Rajab is mentioning now. Because the dulja, uh, I'll just throw it out there, but we're not going to get into that for, for our purpose of discussion. And he, some, of the, some of the ulama mentioned that a dulja is the early part of the night. But it seems that even Rajah's position is, is stronger. Wallahu a'lam. No. These, the meaning of this is that these three periods are times of journeying to Allah through performing actions of obedience. These are the end of the night, the beginning of the day, and the end of the day. Allah, exalted is he, subhanAllah, has mentioned these times in his sayings. When he, when he says, وَذْكُرِ اسْمَ رَبِّكَ بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَاسْجُدَ لَهُ وَسَبِّحُ لَيْلًا طَوِيلًا So, uh, again, now what the author is going to do is mention several uh, passages, uh, ayat from the Qur'an, that emphasize these times so that to show that these times are not just mentioned in this hadith of the prophet والسلام, but that they are mentioned by allah Azzawajal himself in the quran now the translation of those two verses remember the name of thy lord at morn and the evening and worship him a portion of the night and glorify him through the live live long night and glorify your Lord all the while praising him before the rising of the sun and before the going down thereof. And glorify him some hours of the night and at the two ends of the day that you may be well pleased. Seems like this is Yusuf Ali's early translation. <laughs> قال تعالى وسبح بحمد ربك قبل طلوع الشمس وقبل الغروب ومن الليل فسبح وأدبار السجود. And glorify your Lord all the while praising Him before the rising of the sun and before its setting, and in the night time glorify Him, and after the prescribed prostrations. Notice here وذكر اسم ربك right remember the name وسبح right تسبيح طيب. وذكر الله تعالى الذكر في طرفي النهار في مواضع كثيرة في كتابه كقوله تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا اذكروا الله ذكرا كثيرا وسبحوا بكرة وأصيلا قال تعالى واستغفر نعم واستغفر لذنبك وسبح بحمد ربك بالعشي والأبكار قال تعالى ولا تطرد الذين يدعون ربهم بالغداة والعشي يريدون وجهه قال تعالى في ذكر زكريا عليه السلام فأوحى إليهم and سَبِّحُوا بُكْرَةً وَعَشِيَّةً وَقَالَ تَعَالَى وَسَبِّحْ بِالْعَشِيَّةً وَلَبِكَارَ نعم شيء All of them together, the, the next translation Allah the Most High mentions the remembrance of him at the two ends of the day in numerous places in his book such as the translation which reads O you who believe, remember Allah with much remembrance and glorify him morning and evening The next, and ask forgiveness for your sin and glorify your Lord all the while praising him at the fall of night, and then the early hours. And then another verse of the Quran, repel not those who call upon their Lord at morn and evening, seeking his face. He said concerning the remembrance of Zachariah alayhi salam, and signify to them, glorify your Lord at morning and fall of night. And then the last passage from the Quran translated as, and glorify him at the fall of the night and in the early hours. Yes, yeah, subhanAllah. So 
Um, it, not to belabor the issue, but I, I really do think it's important for us to make the, the connection here. The, the Prophet Isaiah Salat was saying, is talking about what journey? The journey to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a spiritual journey. But he's comparing it to, to a physical journey, right? Um, and when is the best time to make that make a journey from one place to another place? Night. Why do you say the night? Because the night is calm. It's, it's calm. He's going to talk about that in a minute. Has anybody here ever driven a truck like for a living, trucker? Driven yeah. a truck. When you like to travel? Me? Yeah. <laughs> Most truckers. Because my schedule is like that. Okay. But Mo nighttime it is common. Most truckers like to travel at night or or at the very beginning, like they like to get a nice portion in at that real early time of the day. That's that ghadwa, right? There you go, three o'clock in the morning. Which is really night, by the way. Right. It's not the morning. Right. Technically, that's not the morning. But but they like to go out there and they, they cut a nice portion of the, of the of the travel during that time. That's that that's that ghadwa. Roha is, is later on in the evening. What dulja is, it, you know, when you when you get in that real nice night portion. In. All right. Now, that's even until today. But if you think about if you think about the immediate audience of the Prophet Isaiah Salatu Sadam. Are they traveling with air conditioners and trucks and all this type of stuff? What are they traveling on? Camels, right? I'll tell you. And when's the best time to travel? A Thor time? You can kill the animal. It's too hot. So the best time for them to travel was actually in that early morning period before the sun got too high, right? In the latter part of the day. Right, so you're talking about after Asab time when the sun is actually going down, so they, they, they traveled in, and then during the night. Those are the best times to travel. And the Prophet Sadam is describing this journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, drawing an exact parallel, right, for the immediate audience that he's talking to, showing them that similarly, that worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want a journey to Allah? These are your best times. These are your best times to do so. Right. He's drawing that parallel. Inshallah, as we as we go along, we'll, we'll start to see how this how this plays out. Uh, we had two minutes. Let's go, Sheikh. Let's go. Let's get this last paragraph. Out of these three times, there are two which are at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. At these two times, one finds both obligatory and optional actions to do. The obligatory actions are the prayers of Fajr and Asr. And these two are the best prayers of the five daily prayers. These are the prayers prayed at the two cool periods. And, who, and whoever preserves these two prayers shall enter paradise. Right, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ صَلَّى مَنْ حَافَذَ عَلَى الْبَرْدَيْنِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ And whoever preserves, uh, consistently performs the, the bardain, right, which is the two cool prayers, that's, that's Fajr and Asr, will enter paradise. Now, it is said, it is said about both these prayers that they are the middle, middle prayer. The middle prayer, Salat al-Wusta, is Salat al-Asr and not Salat al-Fajr. No. As for the optional deed, then it is to remember Allah after the Fajr prayer until the sun rises. And after Asr, until the sun rises, until, until the sun sets. Right. There are many texts concerning the excellence of this. Okay, so we'll stop there, inshallah, ta'ala. But I, I'll, and we'll come back and we'll start here. Again, out of the three times... Right? Out of the three times that I've mentioned, Al Ghadwa, Wal Roha, Wal Dulja, the two that are at the end of the day, in the beginning of the day, they're both obligatory acts prescribed, Fajr and Asr, and voluntary, optional acts that are prescribed, specifically the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're going to talk, uh, inshallah, the next time about the importance of Adhkar, As Sabah, Wal Masa, and he making the specific du'as and dhikrs that the Prophet ﷺ would make in the morning and in the evening and bi'idni da'i ta'ala uh, will wrap up this book in the next two uh, the next two readings bi'idni lahi ta'ala wallahu ta'ala alam subhanakallahu wa bihamdika shalom da'i la'i 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 la'